Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Just now, when I brought to my daughter, she said, uh, you've preached from this before. <laughs> and yeah, this is actually the third time I'm preaching from the same passage. Uh, uh, don't worry, it's a different message. A couple of weeks back, I was standing at the checkout line, contemplating the wonderful Bangalore heat, wondering why the people ahead of me were taking so long to pay, when I felt a firm but gentle touch on my left forearm. Now, I'm not one who likes being touched and not given to someone touching me. But when I looked, I saw a little girl, perhaps four or five years old, and she was doing something that only a child would do, something that was so moving that even I, with my dislike of being touched, found my displeasure dissipating. She was trying to make me clean. You see, she had thought that this birthmark was a bit of dirt on my forearm and was trying to rub it off and make me clean. May God bless her wherever she is. Let us pray. Gracious Father, you have brought us here by your will, by your spirit. And we ask that you would fulfill your purpose today for us. And also wherever that little girl is, we ask that you would bless her. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I lived in the U.S. for 11 years. <laughs> yes, 11 years. And I noticed something during those years. Inevitably, just before Christmas or an Easter, prominent magazines, the U.S. News and World Report, Newsweek, Time, would run articles proposing some new theory about Jesus. But all these supposedly new theories or discoveries are like that uh, two-minute treats that we all love to hate. You know what I'm talking about. Maggie, yes? For a few months they were taken off the shelves. Now they're back with a bang. Some slight modifications in the packaging. And there we are, stuffing our bellies with lead once again. Inside is pretty much the same. We've tasted it. No, no change. The lead tastes the same. But the outside, slight changes in the packaging, and now Nestle can say, hey, you have improved. I'm pretty sure nothing has changed. But anyway, all these supposedly new theories about Jesus, if you study them further, you can determine that they are pretty much identical in content to previously proposed theories. New packaging, maybe some new terminology, new people associated with them, quotes from new people, you know, not quoted before, but pretty much the same content. In fact, most of these old theories that are newly spun are variations on a single theme. Jesus was only human, he probably got married and had children, maybe wandered around the world, probably came to India, some of them. Yeah. And the church has suppressed all of this for 20 centuries. If you think this carries a whiff of Dan Brown, you are right. The guy made millions borrowing from older ideas. We should be so lucky. The Apostle John ends this gospel with the words, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose even the whole world would not have room for the books that could be written. In other words, John, as an eyewitness to Jesus' life, knew of many, many other things. But he chose to write down some of them and exclude others. In other words, he has chosen to write about Thomas. And we must ask ourselves, why? It is not enough that we read. We must ask ourselves, why did this guy who knew so much about Jesus, 
who even ends his gospel three times because he couldn't stop. Why did he write about Thomas? In the first century too, we have to realize the church had to deal with spurious theories. We can see this especially in the writings of Paul, who's writing to churches. This is what you're facing. This is what you need to do. We can see this in the book of Revelation. It is something to be expected. In Jesus, God had done something so completely unanticipated that it would take the church centuries to just come to grips with something new had been done, let alone actually understand it. By the time John was writing his gospel around the end of the first century, he might have been the only person alive who had actually seen Jesus in the the flesh. Others had heard the stories, and some of them had begun to spin fanciful tales about Jesus. You should read some of those fanciful tales, really cool stuff. I can can direct you that way. One group of tales, very prominent in the late first century, will, will, will flourish and in the second century and third century would become what systematically we now call Gnosticism. One of the key Gnostic books is what is known today as the Gospel of Thomas. You have probably heard about this book just a couple of years ago. It was in the news as though it was something recently discovered. It is not recently discovered. Fragments of it have been known to exist since the 5th or 6th century. And the whole copy was found in 1945. It is nothing new. If you hear the Gospel of Thomas new, tear that bit of paper up and say, these guys are pulling, trying to pull a fast one. But anyway, probably brought together in its final form in the late 2nd century, the teachings contained in this book would have been floating around in the decades before, probably when John was writing his Gospel. The teachings in the Gospel of Thomas are attributed to Thomas. Clear from the title, right? John has chosen to tell us about Thomas to set things straight about Thomas and through Thomas, Jesus. In other words, the narrative about Thomas is polemic in nature. It is argumentative. John is trying to make a point through these passages. He is not just giving us information. He is demolishing a prevalent and erroneous view about Jesus that was being spread in Thomas's name. In fact, if you look at the Gospel, all four appearances of Thomas, where Thomas actually contributes to the, to the scene, are included precisely to counter Gnostic beliefs. So there are two directions we can now take. First, we can look at detail at how these appearances of the Thomas Center are, you know, counter these Gnostic claims and we can pay special attention to today's passage. The second option is we can briefly look at the conclusions such a study would lead to and consider its relevance for our lives. As I prepared for today's message, I realized not only that there isn't time to do the first option, but also that that was not where God was leading me. So for those of you who have ever wondered, probably every time I come up here, whether I will ever give something of personal application, today is your day. You will probably get something. I don't know what, but something. So let us briefly go over the conclusions. If any of you want to know the thought process, the logic that led me here, please do come to me. I will give you this gnosis freely. A word of caution. We must interpret John as responding to the Gnostic ideas of the first century and not to the more developed Gnosticism of the second and third centuries. Only then will we be able to understand what John is trying to do. We should not confuse the history of this Gospel. So a brief overview of the first century Gnostic ideas, if I can get this. All right. Yeah. Here are some key beliefs in a somewhat logical order. First, first, okay, there you go. Jesus was sinless. I think we should have no problem there. If you're thinking, what is wrong with Gnosticism? Jesus was sinless. We agree. Hey, we'll all be Gnostics. No, wait, hold on. Second, God is just. Huh, we can go with that also, right? 
Third, God will not punish a sinless person. And now you're probably thinking that there are some theological eggshells cracking around you. So fourth, God did not send Jesus to his death. Mm, we might have some problems, major problems here, I think. Uh, fifth, to pacify the Jews and the Romans, God made it appear as if Jesus was on the cross even though he wasn't. And you're thinking, yeah, wait a minute, what next? Can, can you say that again? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, only appear to be on the cross. But we're not done. Wait, six. No human can live a sinless life. And you're thinking, ha ha, okay, we can go there. There, there you go. None of us has, so there you go. Nice, nice stuff. Uh, okay, so Jesus was not truly human. And we find our, our theology is derailed once again. And finally, oh God, Jesus only appeared to be human when all along he was just in a parishion, you know, appearing to people, uh, the divine manifesting in the physical realm, stuff that you hear outside, the divine manifesting in the physical realm. And we are completely lost here, in, at least in terms of the biblical revelation. So there you go. Uh, Naveen, could you please switch this off? We have enough of this being distracted by Gnosticism. I'm a person of science. I teach mathematics, I teach physics, I love logical arguments. And, you know, there's a lot of logic there to these Gnostic arguments. Quite considerably strong. The problem is that the most important parts of human life do not follow any clear reasoning of logic. Think about it. I love my wife, I love my parents, I love my children, I love my sister. I love them all in different ways. I know that, they know that. But I cannot explain it. I can't even explain why I like chocolate ice cream. Can you? No. I can explain why if I throw ice cream at you, it will hit your face and maybe melt and all that, but I can't. You know. You know, the most important parts of your life just defy logic. Systems of faith devised by humans are almost always reasonably logically sound. Let me repeat. Systems, divide, systems of faith devised by humans are almost always reasonably logically sound. They're not fully logically sound. They're reasonably logically sound. Otherwise people won't believe. But a hard devotion to logic spells the imprisonment of grace. A hard devotion to logic spells the imprisonment of grace. Grace cannot flourish when you say, as you sow, so shall you be. Anyway, we are now in a position to see what John was doing in this passage. In each of the passages involving Thomas, and you would see that that is why Thomas appears so prominently in just this gospel, which is written at the time when John was facing these problems. John, Thomas first speaks to us in chapter 11. Following the death of Lazarus, Jesus tells his disciples that they will go to Bethany, and then Thomas says, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas, the one who supposedly thought that Jesus was only an apparition, was ready to die with Jesus. Apparitions don't die. I don't know about you, but no. Apparitions don't die. So what Thomas was thinking was just Jesus was able to die. He was not an apparition, but a human. The next time Thomas speaks is in chapter 14. Jesus tells his disciples that they know the way to where he is going, and Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How do we know the way? Thomas, the one who had this secret knowledge, the gnosis needed for salvation, is clueless about where Jesus was going. Any special knowledge that Jesus gives after this is not private knowledge, it is public knowledge, because Jesus is speaking in the open. 
Thomas did not have any special knowledge that supposedly is contained in that gospel according to Thomas. The third time Thomas speaks is today's passage. He was not present when Jesus first appeared to his disciples and he demands proof. What proof did he demand? That Jesus would walk through walls? That Jesus would speak to all of them? That's what an apparition would be able to do. An apparition would be able to just appear out of nowhere. It's an apparition. An apparition would be able to talk then. Because I guess apparitions could do that. But he doesn't ask for that. What he asks for is to see the nail marks on Jesus' hands. Put his finger where the nails were. And put his hand at Jesus' side. He's asking for absolutely incontrovertible proof that Jesus was physical, not some apparition that might have fooled the others. This Thomas who supposedly spread the message that Jesus was an apparition, that Jesus never died, was asking for proof precisely that Jesus had been on the cross and had died. The last time Thomas appears in the Gospel is by the Sea of Galilee. There he is a witness. He sees Jesus cooking breakfast. I don't know about you apparitions holding cooking utensils. doesn't seem to be quite okay. Jesus cooks breakfast and shares it with them and eats with them. And Thomas, supposedly believing that Jesus was an apparition, shares breakfast with an apparition. Does it make sense? All four passages in which Thomas appears are characterized by one thing. Physicality. Physicality. And this makes sense of John's prologue. The whole point of his prologue captured in that one phrase. The word became flesh. Physicality is a major theme in the gospel according to John. In other gospels, Jesus just says and the person is able to see. In the gospel of John, he has to mix the mud there and place the mud there and ask the guy to go and wash himself. All of that is there in the gospel of John. The physicality of the gospel of John cannot be lost on us. And in every passage that Thomas appears, it is physical in nature. So what does that have to do with us today? Unfortunately, contemporary Christianity has become world denying. We believe that the world is evil. We hear it. Many popular Christian leaders teach us that this world is anyway headed for destruction. We are anyway headed up to heaven. Let this world go to hell. Who needs to care for it? We are told that faith is a private matter. That it does not need to show up in the public sphere. It's between God and the believer. And that Christianity is concerned with the spiritual rather than the material. We read books and hear messages, we hear the words worldly, carnal, flesh, all used in negative ways. And we develop an aversion to things in this world, things that are material, things that have to do with our physicality. The popular singer Jim Reed sang a song, This World Is Not My Home. Popular song, and we bought into that world in denying you. Another singer, Randy Newman, wrote a song, Heaven is my home, and the Lutheran hymnal and other hymnals includes, I am but a stranger here. All promoting the idea that we are fish out of water, placed in this world, but belonging somewhere else. I don't know about you, but God has placed me here. God himself has made this world, and he has made it for us to live in. In other words, this is precisely the world we are supposed to live in. Yes, it is a broken world. No one can deny that. Yes, it is not how God meant it to be. The Bible is clear about that. And yes, there is sin and pain and death. We are living examples of all of that. But that does not change it from being suited to us, nor for our being suited to it. 
Allow me to draw a few analogies. Please note, these are just analogies. Unlike some preachers, I do not know your personal problems. What if you as a child, as a parent, sorry, had a child with a birth defect? Do you hope for another child instead of the one that God gave you? What if you, if you're married, discover that your spouse had a terminal illness? Would you hope for another spouse instead of the one God gave you? What if you as a child had parents who could not afford the things that your friends' parents could? Would you hope for other parents instead of the one God gave you? What if you as a human woke up to a world filled with sin and pain, not what you hoped or imagined for? Would you look forward to another world instead of the world God gave you? To want to depart this world and go to heaven is tantamount to saying that some things even God cannot heal. Please be very clear about that. If you want to leave here and don't want to be on a restored earth, what you're saying is that God cannot heal this earth. How are you so sure he can leave you then? The earth did not sin. The vision of scripture is that God will heal everything. Restore everything. Renew everything. The resurrection of Jesus makes physicality central to our faith. We are ridiculed for it because of the physicality of our hope. Thomas's desire to see and touch Jesus' wound makes it clear that Jesus will always bear the scars of our redemption and we sometimes sing about it also. But if Jesus will always bear the scars, then physicality of our redemption is also something we need to take a grip of. It must mean something today. And it does. So two things to take home. First, God created this universe a physical universe with physical beings such as you and me and our pets and the cows and the goats and everything else, the trees. A physical world. And he said at the beginning that it was good. And so this world, despite the pain and suffering around us, is good. And God created these physical beings to offer him physical worship. We sang about it also. Every breath that I take, apparitions and spirits do not take place. Physical. And so we must care for and love this creation that God cares for and loves. The numerous species of plants, animals that populate our world are dear to God and we must exercise our stewardship of the planet just as God would with the goal of redemption, not destruction. Second, if God made us physical beings to offer physical worship, then every task that we undertake with our bodies carries the possibility of being sacred. Our work becomes a part of our worship. From waking a loved one in the morning to even negotiating a contract. From comforting a friend to completing a report. From sharing in someone's joy to sitting with them in their sorrow. Every little thing becomes an arena for worship. And so I would like to think that little girl too was worshipping or trying to clean my forearm. 
This is the great truth of the crucifixion, the incarnation, the resurrection, that by assuming every aspect of human life, especially the physical, Jesus has redeemed and restored everything, especially the physical. The question is, dare we believe this? Dare we begin to worship him? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that 